Okay. So now let's turn our attention to sampling. Uh, so the entire process we've been talking about, we're uh, in statistics, we're often trying to understand something about a overall population. And we do that by collecting information about a sample. And so what we need to do then is to talk about how do we construct these samples. There actually are a lot of different ways. There are different considerations in terms of what makes a good sample and what is not. And so we want to talk about uh, what those things are, uh, what might go wrong, what types of methods we can use, and uh, see some examples of each of those. Okay. All right. So the key reason why we use a uh, sample is essentially because uh, in most cases, trying to understand an entire population by collecting information about everything in the population is just not feasible. Uh, uh, it's called a census when you're able to collect information about every single individual. And that's usually not possible because uh, in most cases, the population we're interested in is too large or the cost of constructing um, uh, a data set involving every member would be uh, too expensive or too time consuming. Uh, for many reasons, it may not be possible. Because of that, we use a sample. And uh, if we choose our sample well enough, then that sample should have the same characteristics we expect from the population overall, or at least close enough to them. And then it is what we call representative. And so we have a few different methods we can use then to achieve that goal. Um, yeah, just move it at that. Okay. So there's three big ideas to keep in mind whenever you're constructing a sample. And these are not in your textbook. This is actually a philosophy that I've uh, been trained in from uh, previous statistics work. Um, when you're working with a, uh, a sample, the key thing is to think we're looking at a part of the whole. Okay, so since this is impossible, so we want to find a sample, but we want that sample to be representative. And in that case, it's easiest to collect a small sample, obviously, but we need a sample of sufficient size and chosen with sufficient randomization to ensure that it is representative. And that means it does represent the population reasonably well. It reasonably approximates the population overall. Okay. Randomize, that's a key thing to do in sample. We want to ensure that each individual in the population has a fair, random chance of selection. It doesn't necessarily mean equal chance, but a fair chance. Um, and that equality might be determined by how much of the population they represent. The sample size is also an important thing to keep in mind. A sample needs to be large enough for the statistical results to have meaning. If I'm doing a political poll and I ask 10 people how they feel about a particular candidate, I am not going to be able to use that information to include very much. Unless all 10 agree on something, chances are I won't be able to draw any strong conclusions. And even then there might be questions about the construction of the sample. Um, typically you want a much larger sample. But it turns out it's interesting that you don't need a huge sample to conclude a lot of information. Uh, we usually want at least 40 for most samples, and depending upon the type of thing we're studying and how much accuracy we want, we may want a significantly larger group. But you'll find that most polls that uh, pollsters use are actually somewhere in the hundreds to thousands of total participants, and yet they might represent the entire country. And it's, it's interesting, but uh, you can look statistically at why it works. That sample size is actually large enough to draw a fair number of conclusions as long as the sample is constructed with the proper randomization to ensure representativity. All right. I alluded to this before, but I want to make sure that you keep this in mind every time we construct a sample. Every time we construct a sample, even if we use the same method from the same starting points, we may end up with a slightly different group in our sample. And that slightly different group may have slightly different values of the statistic. That sampling variability is what that is called. It's completely normal. We expect it every time we construct a new sample, even using the same methods, we may see something slightly different. And in fact, later in the course, we'll talk about quantitating, uh, quantitatively um, exploring this sampling variability. We'll actually think about 
constructing a range of possible samples, which ones are most likely, which ones are less likely, and that's how we'll decide, is my sample likely under my initial assumptions that I referred to earlier on when I talked about hypothesis testing. But the key idea here is different samples constructed at different times will have different results. Hopefully not terribly different, but they, they could be different. And that variability is completely expected. And part of the process of statistics is trying to manage that and understand how much variation is just the random variation we expect to see from one sample to the next, and how much is actually a difference between two groups. All right. So randomization was one of the key ideas uh, in constructing a good sample. So how do we produce a random sample? Um, the key word there is the word random, and it is actually a really hard word to pin down. If you ask any computer scientist or mathematician, um, the, the word random is kind of loaded. It's actually really hard to ensure that something is actually random. You may have observed before a table of random numbers. Uh, well, that's not random because uh, the computer printed it out, and once it's printed out, it's there in perpetuity. Even the random number generator um, on a computer program, if you've ever written a computer program and used a random number generator for it, or your calculator, um, it uses a seed, which is usually built on something like uh, the current time. And uh, if you start with the same seed, you'll end up with the same random number. So it's still not quite random in the sense that we usually think of the word random as being. Um, so it's kind of hard to ensure that things are random. And there's a few techniques that we'll talk about uh, that we uh, as statisticians can use. Uh, the simplest, perhaps not by accident, is called a simple random sample. And all we need there is if I consider every possible combination of individuals in my population, if every single possible combination is equally likely, then that is what's called a simple random sample. Okay. You could think of, uh, for instance, if I were to draw names out of a hat, that would be producing a simple random sample because um, each individual is equally likely on the first draw and each of the remaining individuals is equally likely on the next draw, and so on. And so if I envision doing this over and over and over again, every single possible ending sample is equally likely in the long run. All right, how do I do that? Well, the drawing in a hat is one way to think about it. Um, that's not really feasible if you have a population that's, for instance, all U.S. adults. Um, I can't put all U.S. adults into a hat and then draw names out like that. Uh, but instead, one thing I could do is I could have a list of all the individuals in the population. Right? I can even just have this be uh, something I'm visualizing. I have this list. That's called my sampling frame. It's where I'm going to draw my sample from. And I can use uh, the quote-unquote random numbers from a computer-generated uh, random number generator to list, to select the ones in that list. Okay, so here's exactly how that would work just as a single example. Suppose you uh, are working for the Institutional Research Department um, for a particular institution, and you find that there are 731 students enrolled in statistics that year at that school. And you want to find a sample of eight students to ask some survey questions about this new technique that we're, uh, we're using to teach statistics. We can select the students who will belong to the simple random sample using a random number table. So this is a table here that's been produced of random five-digit numbers. What we do is we have 731 students. So we're going to look for numbers that are between 1 and 731. Okay. So I will read off the first three digits. I'll start at a random place in here. Again, I can use my same random number generator to decide where to start. And I will read off the first three numbers, 719. Right. And I block those off. So it looks like I'm going to take my first member of the sample is uh, student number 719 in that list. Then the next number, 662. It's the next three digits here, 662. I take number 662 in the list. The next student is number 004, so the fourth student on the list. Then the 53rd student, the 589th student, and so on. So I can keep going, 
until I end up with um, this last student in my group is student number 129. At that point, I have my eight members for my sample, so I stop. The thing that might come up there, I might find uh, one of my three-digit numbers is larger than 731. Maybe I get uh, 750. I have to decide what to do with that. The standard approach is to just ignore those. That's the most common way to handle that. Um, I decide how many are in my sample frame, and I only look for numbers up to that amount. Anything that comes out beyond that, I just throw it away and keep going and move to the next number on the list. Any questions about that? So that's a simple way of sample. That's one method of doing it. Uh, that will give each possible combination, uh, each group of eight out of the 731, an equally likely chance. Uh, anyone who's done uh, probability may remember combinations. 731 combination eight or 731 choose eight. That's a binomial coefficient that would be exceptionally large. There's a very large number of possible groups of eight that come out of that. Each one is equally likely if you use this process. So that's really useful. All right, so the second type that we need to be familiar with is what's called stratified random sample. Has anyone ever heard the term stratify or strata before? Okay. So uh, the most common place, at least the place I remember seeing first, was actually in um, geology. Um, the layers of rock are called strata. Um, so you can think of strata as like separate layers, but for what we're doing uh, in statistics, uh, our strata are separate groups. We take our entire population and we do what's called partitioning it. We separate it up into distinct chunks. Basically, we chop it up into separate pieces. Those pieces together make up the entire group, and there's no overlap between them. Okay, So each of those groups is called strata, or a stratum, an individual would be stratum, uh, and the groups overall are called strata. Stratified random sampling is using that simple random sampling within each strata. Okay, so what I might do is I might stratify um, the survey that I'm looking at by a number of characteristics. I might separate people into different groups by those characteristics, and then choose a simple random sample within each group. Okay, if I take little bits from each group, that's called a stratified random sample. And the reason you might want to do that, if I'm doing a political poll, for instance, I might want to stratify, stratify that by gender, income, race, or other characteristics that I think might have some impact on their response to the survey. I might also choose to weight that so that it is relatively representative of the population as a whole. Okay? And so if I do that, that is called stratified random sample. It's generally only useful when you can separate them into groups so that the groups themselves are the same based on that characteristic of stratification, but from one group to the next, you have differences. Okay? So for instance, if I were to stratify based on uh, uh, income, I would want no overlap between income in group A and income in group B, but I would want everyone in, in group A to have a roughly similar income level, and everyone in group B to have a roughly similar income up. That's what stratification is doing. <clears throat> All right. The next type is systematic sampling. And in this case, the best thing to do is to think about my sampling frame, where I'm drawing my sample from, as perhaps a long list. Like, I have a spreadsheet, for instance, of the entire uh, student body at UMA, for instance. I don't. But if I did, that would be a, a possible sampling frame. A uh, systematic sample would be Coming up with a rule that allows me to decide where to start in that list, and then how to deduce what the next member will be. So the most common way to do that is, <clears throat> excuse me, if I take a list of people that might be in my sample, I can select a random place to begin, and then select every 10th student or every 50th student on the list. And then I can keep going until I have either the desired number or until I have gone all the way through my sample all the way through my frame. Okay. That is called a systematic sample because there's a systematic rule for deciding who's in the sample and who's not based on the sample frame. That is also a reasonable 
uh, source of randomization, as long as the order in your sampling frame doesn't have any impact on the thing you're trying to measure. So for instance, if I am trying to measure, uh, I don't know, uh, the average GPA among students at UMA, uh, I could do that by uh, a sample frame involving all the students, and I could use a systematic sample to produce them. That would be a reasonable way to uh, produce a sample for that study, as long as alphabetical order has no impact on GPA. Seems like a reasonable assumption. I don't think people whose last name begins with an A will necessarily have a different GPA than people whose last name begins with a T. Uh, but you know, if that were the case, I would not want to use a systematic sample because the order in my frame would impact um, the structure of the sample itself, okay. and therefore would impact the representativity of the sample. As long as there's no connection between the order in my sampling frame and the uh, variable I want to study, then a systematic sample can be representative, and it's often a reasonable way to do it. Um, another way to think about this is uh, looking at a phone book, for instance. If everyone's listed in the phone book, I could just randomly select uh, a starting point and then pick how many pages passed to go to find the next question I call. That would be a systematic sample. All right. Cluster sampling is often confused with stratified sampling because there's some similarities. So I'm going to try to emphasize the differences here as well. When we do cluster sampling, we take the entire population and we split them up into representative clusters. So we're separating the entire population into distinct groups. That's a similarity with the, strat with the stratified sampling. But rather than collecting a small number from every group, which is what we do for stratified sampling, we randomly select which clusters to include, and then we include everyone in those clusters. Okay? So, for instance, if I wanted to, again, study UMA's freshman class, I could do that by grouping students by English class, for instance. And I could select a subset of the classes to include in my sample. Maybe uh, section 1, section 3, and section 11 are all included but then the other sections are not represented at all. That would be a cluster sample. On the other hand, a similar stratified sample would include a few students from every single section of the course. And that's the distinction between stratified and cluster. Any questions about that? The key difference to look for is, out of each group, how many am I taking? Am I taking a few from every group, or am I taking all of a few groups? If I'm taking a few from every group, that is stratified random sample. If I'm taking all from a few groups, that is cluster sample. And then lastly, I think this is perhaps even not in your book, but it's an important one to mention. Uh, there are what are called multi-stage samples, and that's where I might involve multiple different pieces of this. A uh, multi-stage example might mean uh, I could uh, cluster by English class, so decide which sections of those classes to include in my sample, and then I can use a systematic sample to choose a subset from each of those chosen classes. So that really wouldn't be cluster, because I'm not including all of the students in those classes, and it also wouldn't be a systematic sample, because uh, I'm not including everyone in my sampling frame as an element of that list. It's a combination of those two things in successive steps. And that's the key idea of a multi-stage sample. It's one that combines more than one method at a time. Okay. All right. So what kinds of things can go wrong when you're collecting a sample? Well, again, the key idea when we collect a sample is we want it to be representative of our population. We want to draw conclusions from the sample that translate to something we can conclude about the population as a whole. We want it to be representative. So we have to be careful to control for characteristics that might influence that. Some things that might happen under coverage. If there are certain groups that are not represented in my sample, and those groups may differ from the rest uh, of the population, I need to make sure that I account for that. Self-selected samples. If I ask people to respond to a survey, 
but I leave it up to them whether to respond or not. Some people will respond and some people will not. A common example of this is uh, student evaluations. If I were to hand out student evaluations and ask, how good of a teacher am I in your statistics class? Well, the people who respond are more likely to be the people who have strong opinions. The people who really liked my teaching style or the people who really disliked my teaching style are far more likely to respond to that survey than the people who were lukewarm. And he was all right. But, you know, a teacher is a teacher. Statistics is statistics. What can I say? Those people are likely not to be as represented. And it's because uh, that notion of choosing to respond implies how strongly you feel about it. So we may not see the opinion of people who feel less strongly about it. Self-selected samples can cause problems with this. Small sample size is, of course, a problem. Um, the easiest way to see how that works is to just uh, consider the coin flip idea. When I flip a coin four times, um, I may see two heads and two tails, and I may not. If I don't see two heads and two tails, it doesn't tell me that it's uh, a biased coin. Right? It could still be a fair coin. Uh, there's some variation there that I expect, and four is just too small of a sample to really know anything about. On the other hand, if I flip that coin 4,000 times, and I find 3,000 heads, I'm pretty sure that's a biased coin, right? And so the sample size is really what makes the difference there. If your sample size is too small, then your sample is not useful for making, uh, for drawing conclusions. Non-response bias. So people who choose not to respond. If I'm standing on the street corner asking people survey questions, the people who just walk on past, uh, maybe they just don't want to spend the time on it. That's also an issue. Uh, undue influence, if I frame the questions that I'm asking, or if uh, I, as your teacher, stand in front of you and ask, how's my teaching? Well, the response you give, especially if it's before final grades have been handed out, may not be representative of the actual feeling of the students in the course. So that's an undue influence uh, situation. 